Hello everyone, welcome back to Engineering Physics Wave Mechanics. Now this is the sixth and final video in this introductory unit, and in this video we'll be covering a topic known as partial derivatives, which is a topic taught to second year engineering and mathematics students typically in a calculus 3 or multi multivariable calculus course. So partial derivatives is actually a topic that's not too complicated at all. And if you know how to do ordinary derivatives, derivatives from your introductory calculus course or from your high school level calculus course, then partial derivatives will honestly just be a piece of cake. But before we jump into partial derivatives, I want to first talk a little bit more about functions and what they mean in general. So of course from your high school level pre-calculus courses, you should have learned that we usually express functions at least, you know, where one dependent variable relies on one independent variable in the form y equals f of x. So we can think about functions as being a sort of machine where we're allowed to change whatever this number inside here is, so whatever this input is, and basically the y variable depends on what the value of x is. And so we can change, we have the freedom to change whatever x is, we have the freedom to change whatever number it can be, and y is, a, there's a relationship between y and x by some relationship like, you know, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed, or y equals sine x, some kind of relationship between the dependent variable y and the input variable x. And so we usually map out these functions a y of form y equals f of x on a plane defined in R2. So this is R2. And so of course we have the x-axis here, and I'll just put all the arrows. So we have the x-axis here and the y-axis here. And so we usually just draw functions like this, for instance, right? So we have a function y equals f of x here. So each corresponding y value ha comes from a corresponding x value. So at this point x, there is this point y, right? And so y completely depends on x. And so the key idea to take away from functions is that when we plug in some number that we choose into this machine, we get some number out. So when we're talking about multivariable calculus now, we have to deal with multivariable functions. So in multivariable calculus, let's, start, let's just do, uh, let's just work with functions of two variables. So for functions of two variables, we denote this as z equals f of x, y. So what does this mean? Well, this means that we have two input variables now. We have the freedom to choose whatever x can be and whatever y can be. And z, we of course don't have the freedom to choose that, right? Z depends on what the value of x and y is by some relationship. So for example, an equation could be z equals x squared plus y squared. That's a relationship, right? And so if we want to talk about functions of the form z equals x, y, or f of x, y, we usually put this, of course, in space, r cubed. So let me just draw three spatial dimensions. So this is our three spatial dimensions, right? So we have, let's see here, we have x. I can put x here, y here, z here. So we have the freedom to choose whatever x we want. So we could go out to this point x, and then we could choose some point y on this y-axis. So any point on this plane is an input space, uh, or is an input point. So basically, instead of having one line, number line along the x-axis to, x to choose what our input number is, we have an entire plane full of numbers from which to choose what a uh, basically pair of coordinates we want to input into this function. So at this point in t at this point on this plane, um, of course there will be a z variable up here, right? So this will be z equals f of x, y. So z equals f of x, y. And if we take a collection of all these points in space, so this is actually the space r cubed. If we take a collection of all these points, we get what is known as a surface in r cubed. So we get some kind of surface that's, you know, basically has a whole bunch of z, ver uh, z points all over here that make up the surface, and they occur on the domain of x and y. So, of course, uh, x and y can be restricted based on some things like, you know, asymptotes and stuff like that from calculus 1 or from just no looking at functions of the form y equals f of x. So the same kind of discontinuities and stuff Im are also imp uh, imposed in multivariable calculus. So we still have domain restrictions and stuff and range restrictions as well. But now you have to think about multivariable functions as basically having the input space be the entire x, y plane. So we can choose any point on here and plug this into the function and get some z variable back or z uh, value back and so all the, the collection of all these z values gives a surface so I'm just gonna write this down surface and so of course uh, in your when you learned about just what uh, functions of the form y equals f of x this is a curve so this is a curve in R2 and of course this is a surface in R3 so if you guys understand this now I think we got we are able to move on and talk about partial derivatives now
So if we want to start our discussion on partial derivatives, we of course need to look at an actual surface in our cube. So as you can see here, we have a function defined as z is equal to f of x, y, which is equal to e to the negative and then in brackets x squared plus y squared. So this is a multivariable function where z is dependent on two input variables x and y. And I actually plotted this surface using a website called GeoGebra. And so GeoGebra is actually like Desmos, except it has quite a few more capabilities, like such as, of course, being able to plot 3D surfaces. So, of course, what I'm going to do is actually analyze a specific point on this surface. And so what I'm going to do is actually take an input 1, 1. So x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1. And if we plug this in, we get that z is equal to e to the negative 2. So if we plot this out now, of course, we get the z or we get the order triplet 1, 1, e to the negative 2. So a partial derivative itself is actually defined to be the rate of change of the dependent variable with respect to one of its independent variables when all other independent variables are kept constant. So, of course, in this case, we have z is being defined in terms of x and y. So we could have partial z partial x where y is kept constant or we could have partial z partial y where x is kept constant. And so it's actually e very easy to calculate partial derivatives from an algebraic point of view. But I want to plot the surface so that you guys could actually see how partial derivatives work from a visual point of view. So if we want to understand how partial derivatives work visually, well, I'm going to actually intersect planes at this point 1, 1, e to the negative 2. So what I'm doing now is actually taking cross sections of this surface at this point 1, 1, e to the negative 2. And so we're looking at planes that basically are parallel to the x-axis and parallel to the y-axis. And so if we actually look at these planes separately, we get an xz plane where, of course, y is equal to 1 is kept constant. And so we also have a yz plane where x equals 1 is a constant. So this corresponds to the partitions that I made in the yellow dotted lines on the actual surface. So this partitioning corresponds to the yz plane where x is equal to 1. And of course, this partitioning corresponds to the xz plane, where of course y equals 1. So if we wanted to, to imagine this on the surface itself, because if you guys are getting confused about, you know, how we're breaking this up and putting these, putting these to the side, this is what it would look like on the surface itself. So if we're looking at the xz plane, where y equals 1, well then of course we look at the constant point y equals 1 here, and we basically just draw it going like this. So this is what our surface would look like, and so you could bring it up even like this, and so, yeah, that's what the oh, xz plane would look like, and that's what I've basically taken out to the side. And for the yz plane, this is what the yz plane would look like. So we look at the point x equals 1, because that's what being, what's being kept constant, and we basically just extend it outwards, and then lift it up, because of course y and z are free variables, so we're extending it freely along the y and the z axes. And so, yeah. And so, of course, as you can see here, the point 1, 1, e to the negative 2 occurs at the intersection of these two points uh, along these two uh, planes, actually, the xz plane and the yz plane along y equals 1 and x equals 1. And so what we're trying to do is actually imagine these planes slicing into the surface itself, because when planes intersect surfaces, they actually uh, create a curve of intersection. Because if you can imagine in R2, like two lines intersecting, well, of course, there's a point of intersection. But when a 2D uh, plane intersects a 3D surface, well, you get an actual curve of intersection. So this is what the curve of intersections would look like in this case. As you can see here, the curvature is kind of the same. It's kind of symmetric all around. So on the XZ plane, for instance, this is what the curvature would look like. This is what the, yeah, the, uh, the basic the line of intersection would look like, right? So curve which is actually just, you know, what you would see on a plane. And on the yz axis, it basically looked the same. It looked something like this. And so what I'm going to do is actually take those away because in the next part, I actually have them defined already. And so let's move on. And so as you can see here, I have two curves defined, c1 and c2. And so the c1 curve is on, of course, the xz plane where y equals 1. And you can see it mapped out on the surface itself. And on, of course, C2, the curve C2 is on the yz plane, where x is equal to 1 is kept constant, of course. And you can see that surface, or that curvature as well, along the plane on the actual surface itself. And so what we do is we can actually analyze the tangent lines at the, sim at the same point. So what we do is define the point, of course, uh, 1, 1, e to the negative 2, which, of course, is in the pink here. And so this is the same point on both planes. And so these planes intersect at this uh, pink point. And so what we do is actually look at the tangent lines to the curves C1 and C2 at this point. 
and the slope of these tangent lines is itself the partial derivative. So as you can see here, the partial derivative along the xz plane along this tangent line is of course partial z partial x, where y is kept constant. And of course, if we're looking at the yz plane at the, the pink point, which is 1, 1, e to the negative 2, we have that partial z partial y is, at, is with a slope where x is kept constant. And just for your own reference, if you guys actually want to find the value of the partial derivative itself, well, then you can just take the partial derivative using just simple algebra. So, of course, we have f of x, y is equal to e to the negative x squared, e to the negative y squared, if you split up the exponent and then bring it down, of course. Uh, so, what we can do is basically just treat one, uh, one thing as a constant, one variable as a constant. So, if we're looking at partial z, partial x, well, then, of course, we're looking at keeping y constant. So, this whole e to the negative y squared term right here is actually all a constant. So what we do is just take the derivative of e to the negative x squared, x squared. And so if you use the chain rule, of course, you bring the negative 2x down and then multiply it with e to the negative x squared again. And e to the negative y squared is, of course, a constant. And if you take partial z partial y where x is kept constant, you get the same thing except you replace the x with the y. And so the partial, partial z partial x is actually equal to partial z partial y at the point x, y equals 1, 1, which is, of course, e to the t or negative 2 e to the negative 2. So hopefully you guys understood that visual representation. It's basically just the slopes of the tangent lines at, at the point, the same point, except we have to look at one along the xz axis and one along the, uh, or the xz plane and one along the yz plane, if that makes sense. So let's move on and actually look at a more algebraically complicated example. So here we have an example that I myself actually created and I apologize in advance because I mean I actually made this example a lot more complicated than I initially intended to. However, I think it is good practice because when you actually will uh, take partial derivatives in later courses and actually apply them to more complicated functions, yeah, I think you guys will be more ready if you guys know how to do this example right here. So this is in this example, it says to find partial psi partial t for a function psi defined in terms of input variables x and t, which of course is defined implicitly by the implicit equation x squared a e to the i omega t minus psi t cubed e to the kx t plus psi xt ln 1 over x equals 5. So to start, let's take partial partial t on both sides of this implicit equation. So what we get is, of course, we're going to get partial partial t on the left side and partial partial t on the right side. But of course, the partial derivative or ordinary derivative of any constant is, of course, equal to 0. So let's go on and actually distribute this partial partial t inside. So this is what we end up getting. So we get partial partial t of x squared a e to the i omega t minus partial partial t of psi t cubed e to the kx t plus partial partial t of psi x t ln 1 over x, of course, is all equal to 0. So I want to point out a few things. And so, of course, I have everything pre-written down just so that my surface doesn't overheat by me just writing all these variables down and just so that it might be actually quicker for you to just see this. So what I want to do is actually point out that any term uh, that can any x variable or any uh, operation that contains an x is a constant because we're taking the partial derivative of psi with respect to time, right, or t. And so we basically we're looking at an instant in time where x is constant. So for instance, this x squared a is a constant. Uh, this x squared a is a constant. And so this x right here is also a constant. This x right here is a constant. This whole ln 1 over x is also a constant. And of course, the partial derivative of 5 is, is of course, can be 0, which is why we have a 0 on the right side. So if we ha keep that in mind, we can take pa these partial derivatives easier. So the next step is, of course, to actually take the partial derivatives of each of these terms now. So the partial derivative of the first term is basically just bringing down the i omega right here by the chain rule. So as you can see here, this x squared a is of course constant. So we don't have to do anything with that. So what we do is we just take the derivative uh, of e to the i omega t. And so of course the e to the i omega t stays the same, but we bring the i omega down with the chain rule. So now what we have to do is actually take the derivative of this whole term right here. And this is quite complicated because we actually have to apply the product rule twice. Because as you can see here, we first have to implicitly differentiate this psi here, right? Because that's the actual function itself. So we can treat this as just being f. And then, of course, we can treat this as being g. 
So if we use the product rule once, we get, of course, partial psi partial t as being f prime. So I'll write this down. This is f prime, and then, of course, this is g, and then plus f, or sorry, this is actually yeah, f, and then g prime, right? g prime because of this prime right here. So we're, we apply the product rule once. However, we will have to apply the product rule again for this t cubed e to the kxt, right? Because there's a t in both terms. There's a t cubed here, and then there's a t inside the exponential argument, right? And so what we do now is for the third term is take the product rule again, but we only have to do it once as opposed to twice for the second term. And so what we do is we take partial psi partial t, right? Because this is f prime, and I'll basically I'll just say this partial or this the psi term right here is actually f. And then this xt ln 1 over x is g. So we take the product rule. So this partial psi partial t is the implicit differentiation. So we get f prime here. And then this xt ln 1 over x is, of course, going to be g. So f prime g plus f g prime. So this psi is, of course, the f. And then this x ln 1 over x is g because that's all constant, right? Because this t is basically like just you, know, you take the derivative of t, right, partial psi partial t of t, well, that's just 1. So this x ln 1 over x is just a constant, right? Because any time we're looking at a constant x because we're looking at a point in time where x is a constant, if that makes sense. So what we're going to do now is go on to step 3. So, of course, this i omega x squared a e to the i omega t, we're done with that. We don't need to worry about that. So the second term we actually need to work with a little bit more because we need to apply the product rule for this t cubed e to the kxt. So, of course, this partial psi partial t, t cubed e to the kxt still stays the same. And, of course, I've distributed this negative sign in. So this negative sign goes here and this negative sign goes here. And so we still have a psi factored out here. But now we take the derivative of the inside. So we can treat t cubed to be f and e to the kxt to be g. So, of course, we get f prime is 3t squared. So f prime and then e to the kxt is g plus kx e to the kxt. So this whole part and this whole part is g prime. And then this t cubed is, of course, f. So we've, we've applied the product rule again. And of course, this last term, we didn't have to do anything else because we took the product rule once and did the implicit differentiation. So we're done there. And so let's move on to step four, where basically we now actually have to isolate uh, partial psi partial t, which was found using implicit differentiation on the second and third terms. So what we do is move any term that doesn't contain this partial psi partial t onto the right side of the equation. So as you can see here, this i omega x squared ae to the i omega t gets sent to the right side. And so let's see here, uh, this partial or this psi x long one over x also goes to the right side. Um, this kx, or actually this entire term goes to the right side. Uh, and so, yeah, what we're left with is partial psi partial t, t cubed e to the kxt. Uh, the negative of that actually is left over here on the left side. And then this partial psi partial t, xt ln 1 over x stays on the, that goes to the, or stays on the left side actually, sorry. And so, yeah, what we do now is factor out the partial psi partial t. And what we get is the final solution. And so partial psi partial t is equal to the negative of all of this. And so uh, where that negative came from is actually from basically saying that, let's see here, xt ln 1 over x. So this ln 1 over x, I just broke it down to ln x to the negative 1. And then the negative 1 came out front. So that became negative 1 ln x to the negative 1. And so there was a negative here and a negative here. And so what I did is I just factored out the negative and brought them outside. So that's why we ended up with a completely positive terms on the bottom. And as you can see here, I did the same thing here. I brought, I took a ln x. So there was a negative one here. It came out here and canceled out the negative that was already there. And so, yeah, that is the complete solution for this example. So hopefully you guys found this video informative. I know this example may be a bit confusing, but don't worry if you didn't understand completely what we did here, just know that when you're taking a partial derivative with respect to, you know, some variable, the other variable of all the other variables that are in that function, that multivariable function are kept constant because we're looking at an instant uh, where we're only looking at basically the, how one variable is changing with respect to the other while all others are kept constant. So that's the key idea to take away. So again, hopefully you guys found this video informative and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching.